Good afternoon and welcome to the Visnich One Black History Month panel discussion. I am Sandy Rodriguez, the EEO AA officer in Atlantic and Cape May counties, and will be moderating the questions of our esteemed panel of judiciary professionals. To learn more about our panel, their bios have been emailed to all to, of today's attendees uh, who registered. This program will run until 4.30. And although you will be muted throughout the session, you can ask questions using the Q&A feature. Your questions will be posed at the end of the session during the Q&A segment of, of this program. If you are seeking CLE credits for this session, the code word will be shared before the Q&A segment today. Our panelists include Superior Court and Municipal Court judges, law clerks, and managers. They will share their background and experiences as African-American professionals in the legal field and the challenges and opportunities that has presented. Let's get started with our first question. Beginning with the Honorable Rodney Cunningham. Superior Court Judge in Criminal Division. Please tell us a little bit about yourself, Judge, including your journey to becoming a Superior Court Judge. Thank you so much, Sandy. First, I wanna thank you again for allowing me to participate in today's program. It's a wonderful opportunity uh, to sit on a panel with such an esteemed group of individuals that are making a difference in our community. As far as my story, um, it's really a simple journey a journey where as a young kid, I always uh, had a passion, a feeling within my own person that it was important for things to be just for people, that there need to be fairness uh, demonstrated to all people, and that rules need to be followed so as to assure a level playing field for everybody um, who is involved with anything. Now, I found that to be the case when it came to doing simple things like playing tag outside, playing kickball, but it was that sense of fairness and justice which inspired me from that early age to know being in a law-related profession was something for me. Um, there was no type of transformative event that directed me to pursue the legal profession, just the feeling that being a lawyer was a thing for me. And based upon that, it became an ever-present goal in everything that I've done throughout my formative years, throughout my um, professional life, leading to the point that I became a judge in 2017. Um, by way of background, um, I attended college at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, during my period of time at Rutgers University, I majored in political science, um, again with the overarching goal of being an attorney. So I knew that I pursued political science as one step toward having the tools necessary and being an attorney who can then go out to take steps to try to assure fairness for people that I uh, represented or came across and then taking steps to see that there is a level playing field for everybody involved. Um, during that time at Rutgers University um, and further being focused to accomplish this overarching goal of being a lawyer, something that I've always wanted to do I think maybe since fifth grade, it came to me that I would seek out the law by going to Washington, D.C. That was something that was always in my mind the whole time I was at Rutgers University, that I was going to go to Washington, D.C., because this is the place uh, where you see laws being made. It seemed to be the focal point for uh, the legal system by way of uh, the Senate, House of Representatives, the Capitol, et cetera. So that turned my focus to working hard as I could to do well so I can go to law school in Washington, D.C. And um, I was fortunate enough to attend Georgetown University Law Center um, between the years of 1991 and 1994, um, a few years ago, but um, it happened nonetheless. Um, during my time at Georgetown, I continued to have that passion for the law and determining that, hey, this is something where I can use this as a vehicle to make a difference 
to make the community better, to uh, reach individual people that I come in contact with. And although Georgetown University is not uh, an institution whose primary focus is trying to hone and create public interest lawyers, it was there during my third year at law school, um, I realized that public interest law was the way for me to go as an opportunity to really give back to the community, to make a difference, to make things better, to let people know that there are people working for them, um, to, to treat them with respect, to try and make a difference, to be a role model through their actions, and to show that the system, um, the law, um, everything could work in, on behalf of individuals uh, who often need to be acknowledged in one way or the other. So it was at that time, my third year in Georgetown, um, I realized that I was gonna pursue a career in public interest. Um, and from that point forward, I had a career in public interest, which evolved from graduating law school and clerking for a judge in Bergen County, New Jersey, a family law judge, um, to gaining employment as a public interest lawyer um, in Philadelphia with the AIDS Law Project of Pennsylvania. Uh, which was a public interest law firm providing representation for people living with HIV and AIDS. Um, and then finding my way to being a staff attorney, an assistant public defender um, for the Office of Parental Representation, where I represented parents and individuals uh, dealing with uh, DIFUS matters or DC PMP matters and trying to assure that children are returned to their care. So it was through that hard work um, and commitment on the singular focus of just being an attorney that um, really allowed me to navigate this entire journey to culminate itself and having the honor of being selected to continue my commitment to public interest, to public service by serving as a judge um, for which I have served since my appointment in June of 2017. So briefly, that's my story. There's no transformative or magic moment that said, that's why I need to be a lawyer. It was just always the, the passion and knowing that you have to do the right thing. You have to see that things are fair for people. You have to try and make um, an impact on those you come across. And for me, it was just using the law as a vehicle to do that so as to make a difference. And more importantly, public interest and public service as a way to do that. So that's my journey to the point that I'm at it right now. Thank you, Judge Cunningham. Next, we'll move to the Honorable Susan Fowler Maven, Superior Court Judge in Family Division. Judge? Thank you, Sandy, for moderating this panel. And thank you for the uh, judiciary, the vicinage, for creating this opportunity to share in this moment during Black History Month. The, my journey um, did have a pivotal moment, but I, I'll start by saying this. I grew up in New York. I'm a native New Yorker, grew up on Long Island uh, in a very integrated community. Um, I would say uh, the way the community was set up in neighborhoods in the area where I lived, um, I dare say that in my early years in elementary school, if there were any other black kids in the school, it was one of my siblings. So needless to say, uh, we grew up in an extremely white area. We lived in a white neighborhood. The school was predominantly white uh, through my elementary school years. I was subject to harassment and racial intimidation in the fourth grade when uh, specifically, and this is my entree into why it's so important what I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, in the fourth grade, it was recess time. We had to play inside because it was bad weather outside. I went to the closet to get some construction paper or whatever I was getting. And one of my classmates was there and he pushed me out of the way and said, get out of my way, you N-word. Well, I knew then that, that was not the nice thing to say because now we're in the, I think it was somewhere in the 60s, the late 60s, early 70s. I knew that wasn't an appropriate response. And I said to him, what did you say to me? And he repeated it. And I 
you know, at that point I struck back, I, I hit him, I flipped him, did my karate chop and knocked him to the ground. And when the aide broke us up and we were sent to punishment room, uh, my teacher was quite surprised to see me in there when she heard what happened. And I said, she said, well, why are you in here? I said, because he called me the N-word. And she was, she was in awe and appalled. And that was my, one of my earliest recollections of being subject to racial uh, issues. Um, fast forward to eighth grade, we were in a social studies class where we were doing a bit of a mock trial of whatever the subject matter was. The teacher was assigning roles from witnesses to jurors uh, to public defense or defense counsel on raising my hand for everything, prosecutor raising my hand, gets to the judge part, the last role to be assigned, I'm squaring in my seat and I'm raising my hand with all kinds of zeal. And the teacher looks at me and says, you can't be a judge and pick somebody else. Well, I don't even remember what happened after that because all I know is that why could not I, who was a top student, had always been a top student, um, uh, why couldn't I be a judge? You know, which ism was it? Was it uh, racism because I was black? Because again, I faced that before. Uh, was it my gender ism because I was a girl? Uh, was it my weight-ism because I was a chubby kid? Which ism was I facing at that time? And I didn't put this into context exactly at that time in eighth grade, uh, all these isms in the way I present this story. And it made me realize at that time in eighth grade, however, that I was going to be a judge and no one was going to tell me I couldn't be a judge. So from that moment on, that very similar moment, that was Mr. Michael Tanoff, eighth grade social studies. Um, I decided that that was going to be my role. Now, I had always been uh, a kid who would seem to mediate when there were disputes between my siblings and the neighbors. If we were playing softball, baseball, volleyball, whatever it was, I was the one who would try and calm everything down, get the rules, decide, you know, who was right, who was wrong. So that was always in me. Um, my sister would say that I argued so much I should be a lawyer, but I, did, I just thought she was picking on me. But after that eighth grade incident, it let me know maybe there's something to this. So from that moment, my was laser focused. I continued to be the good student that I was. I, I made myself, uh, not made myself, but I seemed to rise to those positions of leadership. I was a class president from ninth grade through 12th grade, all the way through high school, notwithstanding the diversity or lack thereof of my community. And I didn't see that as a barrier. I just thought that was my strength. I went to high school, I went to college, went to the University of Pennsylvania. And while there, started by majoring in political science, which I thought that's what you would do if you were going to law school. But then a very wise professor told me, gratefully, that I didn't have to major in political science because if you're going to law school, you can major in whatever you wanted. And so at that point, I decided that I would create a major because the University of Penn did not have a major in African-American studies. So I created one. I put together a plan, a program of all the liberal arts pro, uh, classes and had approved an independent uh, individualized degree in African-American studies, pursued that degree and graduated with a degree of African-American studies but a minor in sociology. Because I wanted to learn more about who I am, who my people were, where we came from. And so I put together an interdisciplinary program to do just that because Penn didn't give me what I wanted in their already designed programs. And so I created one. From there, and while at Penn, very involved in organizations, um, uh, the Black Students Association, doing a lot to try to motivate, develop programs and motivate uh, young people to advocate for themselves and for things, the betterment of the school. Go on to Temple. And while at Temple, um, again, very involved in, in school, the activities of campus, I became the president of the Black Law Students Association at a time uh, when there was quite a few things going on at, in Philadelphia. We had the move. M-O-V-E, the MOVE movement, where they bombed the community uh, while uh, Mayor Wilson Good was in office. At the time, uh, the dean of the law school, Carl Singley, who was the first black dean of Temple Law School, became embattled. And as they tried to remove him, uh, I led the students to speak up on his behalf to try to keep him in his office as dean of the law school. And so again, advocating um, and working with students to do that. Um, as a lawyer, um, it was not my intention to uh, 
always be in a public interest, but it was all my, always my desire to promote uh, diversity, African-American studies, African-American awareness, uh, cultural awareness, and that's just been in my being um, since the beginning. Um, I continue to work in that regard um, between private practice and law practice. I did other things. However, once I became, uh, I always made it known through the Bar Association um, and to those who knew that my goal was I would like to be a judge. Um, now, my pathway to the bench was not normal. I was not a litigator, uh, so I was not in and out of the courthouses. Uh, that was not my practice. I worked for a public agency, and so I didn't have exposure to all the litigants, but I did become extremely involved in the Atlanta County Bar Association, um, and I used my skills and my abilities to help the association and do what I could um, to, to be helpful. And so I was on various committees um, helping the Bar Association with a lot of programming. When the time came, uh, my name, people knew apparently that I wanted to be a judge, the Senator knew and an opportunity presented itself. And I'm very grateful because um, opportunities to become a judge don't happen every day. Every day. Um, and so I was very pleased and honored uh, to receive that request, uh, that nod and went through the process and became a judge, uh, sworn in in December of 2001 and uh, so I've been here for over 19 years. And during that time, and you can read my bio uh, to see a little bit more of what we've done, but that's my pathway to the bench. And I'll talk more later, thank you. Thank you, Judge Maven. Our next panelist is the Honorable Richard Fauntleroy, judge in the Municipal Court of Pleasantville. Please tell us about yourself, Judge. Always got to worry, worry about unmooning myself. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here with uh, my colleagues. Uh, and I think we all share somewhat of a common route to where we are today. Uh, mine started off as growing up here in South Jersey in a small rural community. I went to a predominantly white uh, school system and uh, a predominantly white high school. And I didn't have the unfortunate uh, direct uh, uh, introduction to racism as Judge Maven. But growing up, we always knew. Like when we went to the movies, we always went upstairs to the balcony. We went to the American Legion dances. It was almost like an invisible fence down the middle of the floor. The white kids stayed over here, the black kids stayed over there, and never the two should meet. And, and so you kind of knew that uh, growing up. And of course, I grew up in the 60s. So um, the whole civil rights thing uh, I was involved with in terms of uh, seeing about it by, you know, uh, in church and everything, but no direct impact on me. Um, when I graduated from high school, I went to uh, Cornell University. And I think that's where I, my awakening uh, became more astute. Uh, my freshman year, I was one of 60 black students, excuse me, 90 black students on a campus of 16,000 uh, students. And as you can remember in the 60s, uh, there's a lot of talk about the uh, affirmative action and all that. So it was almost like it was automatically assumed that you were a number. Uh, you didn't have the skills to compete. Uh, you were just uh, a university trying to fulfill some lofty goal uh, through its affirmative action uh, status. I was a member of the African uh, American Society and we were involved in a lot of different things on campus to bring awareness. And we had a lot of unfortunate incidents on campus, uh, including the burning down of the African American Society uh, house that we had our meetings and things in and certain things uh, said to and crosses burned on campus. Uh, so I was involved in what is now the infamous Willard Strait Hall takeover. I wasn't a leader. I was a follower. I was merely a freshman. Uh, and that was the one of those of you who are my age may remember that's when the uh, matter was resolved. The students came out of the uh, building with guns and bandoleros and all that kind of stuff, um, which was unfortunate because I think a lot of people only saw that picture. 
uh, didn't see the overall picture that number one, we didn't go into building with guns and bandoleros. Uh, we were threatened with you know physical harm and death by a, fr a white fraternity. And that's when the guns were brought in. But I think that was the turning point in my um, idealism as, about the law, because obviously uh, none of us in that building were lawyers and we were, were trying to negotiate with the university and there were no black lawyers in Ithaca. Uh, but there was a third year black law student who stepped forward and uh, negotiated uh, for us and for, as it turns out for me, did a great, great job. I was, I was able to stay at Cornell. Uh, but I, I started to see that and when I, I talked to him briefly that, that weekend, not a long conversation or anything, but I asked him why he was doing it because he said uh, there was nobody else to do it. And uh, so I said, oh, yeah. And uh, while at Cornell, um, I, I and another friend, uh, because of the situation with black students, um, got the EEO office at the uh, University School of Agriculture and Life Sciences to set up a program to help black students acclimate uh, when they got there, provided tutoring and mentoring. And my friend and I, uh, I want to say we did a good job because um, the university, well, uh, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences um, wanted us to direct that program. We became directors of that program and we eventually had uh, a staff of uh, 10 students and, and clerical staff to help that program uh, get through. Um, but I also saw the other side. I, I mean, I always felt like you had to take advantage of opportunities. And while there, um, you know, I became a, a, a teaching assistant uh, as an undergraduate um, and I engaged in other things to help, um, I guess, uh, mediation uh, of uh, the, the strife. I, I was also on the football team. So I was kind of like leading a double life uh, because in those days, uh, jocks were not uh, looked that favorably. We were considered uh, working for the man, as they said. Uh, so, so I was straddling the fence and trying to find my way. And uh, I don't know who it was, but someone suggested uh, that I think about law school. Uh, so I did. And I said, well, let me try. And I, I had the good fortune of knowing some uh, people there who, you know, said, look, you know, you, you should, you know, should try to get into uh, the law school here because everybody knows you and everything. And I applied and I got accepted. And I was one of six uh, black students in a class of 145 uh, my first year of law school there. Um, I brought some of my fight with me there. I became uh, chairman of the Black Law Caucus there. And we convinced uh, the law school that they had to do a better job at recruiting minority uh, students. And at that time, even uh, women uh, who were considered uh, much more of a minority than they are today. But we, uh, I think we were successful in opening the eyes of uh, those people to uh, try to do that. And uh, I also was a member of the Legal Aid Clinic uh, where we helped uh, primarily the uh, writing briefs and doing work for the uh, black prisoners that were at uh, Elmira State uh, Prison there in New York. And uh, all the other things that go along with being a uh, law, a law school a student. Um, my evidence professor, um, Dr. Irving Younger, uh, when I told him I was thinking about, I wanted to be a trial attorney, said, well, you know, you should either go to a large firm that has a good litigation section or to uh, uh, a public defender, no, excuse me, a uh, prosecutor or a DA uh, office because there you can pick and choose the trials you want to do. And I, and I took him up on that and I ended up um, being uh, assistant county prosecutor for Atlanta County, where again, I was the only one of myself as an attorney there. But it was a different era then. I, I remember going to Mays Landing with one of the other assistant prosecutors and they were having sidebars and 
And he says, look, come up and get a feel for what it's like, you know? So I, I was standing next to him and I had a judge say to me, well, he didn't say it to me, he said it to the other attorneys. He says, why is the defendant participating in these sidebars? And everybody just looked at him like he, he's, he's not serious, but he was. And it had to be explained that I was going to be one of the assistant prosecutors. And then he, then he welcomed me and everything, but it was like, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, uh, I left uh, the prosecutor's office, joined a, a large firm, um, eventually became a partner there. Again, I was the only one there initially, but I want to think that it was because of me. They did hire some more uh, black lawyers before I left. Uh, um, and, and when it's my own private uh, practice. Uh, in terms of community involvement, I always wanted to be involved in the community. Uh, uh, other professional things include the Legislative Council for the City of Atlantic City. I did a number of municipal uh, prosecutors and public defender uh, appointments, and then became the judge in Pleasantville in 2004 until the, uh, the present. Uh, but as Judge Maven indicated, she was very involved in the local bar association. And I got involved with uh, the state bar association uh, because I was talking to an attorney and he was saying that the state bar was very concerned that they cannot get uh, black and other minority uh, lawyers to join. So out of a whim, I joined uh, uh, the uh, State Bar Association, dragged my wife Diana along with me and forced her to go because I knew I didn't want to be the only one sitting up there in those meetings. And so we used to go up to New Brunswick all the time. And I think it was through that that I became, you, you, you have to take opportunities as they, they come to you. And it was once I got involved with the bar that I started getting appointments to various committees by the Supreme Court one of which was the character committee, which I started off as a um, member of a, a, a part four, I became a chairperson, then uh, was appointed to the statewide panel and eventually uh, chair of the statewide panel. And I think it was important because again, I was the only one there, but I was able to, you know, different people have different ways of looking at things. And I always think that many times the black perspective it's not looked at. And if you're not there to bring it out, then it never gets out. So I always felt that I had to do that. The same is true when I was asked to be on the aisle to board of trustees, I did that, eventually became, became chairman uh, of IOLTA. And I, uh, uh, like I said, served in the minorities in the profession committee with the state bar and eventually became uh, one, of, one of the at-large trustees for the state bar. Uh, where I served in that capacity for two years. Um, and again, I say that's important because you have to, you have to be there for people to see you. If you're not there, they will overlook you. And that's why I always thought that it's important to be there to give a, a perspective. Uh, obviously I served on a number of uh, community boards and things, but my uh, passion uh, was uh, being a youth coach in Egg Harbor Township. I did that for, I guess, 23 years, uh, first starting off at the, the youth organization and then uh, five years as a volunteer coach at the uh, high school. But again, I was there because I wanted to encourage young black men particularly that there are other things to do other than playing sports. And I said, yeah, look, I played uh, football, but, you know, Football, my football years are long gone, but my education, uh, becoming a lawyer, I, I'll have that forever. So I was always trying to encourage them to do that. And of course, my uh, fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha, we've always been engaged in um, community things such as uh, um, go to high school, go to college. Um, we have a re Real Fathers, Real Men program every year where we give out scholarships to young men. Uh, black men. And it, the whole thing is to recognize members in the community that give something above and beyond. So uh, that's sort of like rasped me up in terms of how I got here. Um, 
and I have a lot of stories about things that happened along the way, but I'll wait to that to come out in the uh, second question. Thank you, Judge Fauntleroy. Our next panelist is the Honorable Henry Warner. He is the judge in Municipal Court of Atlantic City. Judge Warner. Thank you, Sandy. You're welcome. It's an honor to be here, uh, certainly with uh, the distinguished uh, colleagues that I have and uh, Judge Fauntleroy, who was one of my heroes growing up, him and Judge Brackley. Um, I didn't know that uh, we're going to be giving such heartfelt stories in terms of our needing to be lawyers. Uh, I, I would just start off by saying I'm a native of Atlantic City. I attended all of the Atlantic City uh, public school from K through 12. I'm a proud Atlantic City Viking. Upon graduating, um, I, I attended Trenton State College, uh, which is now known as the College of New Jersey, uh, which is a great institution. You know, uh, I enjoy, I had the typical college life there. I was part of minority school paper. I played varsity basketball for Trenton State College. I also engaged in volunteer work uh, during the era. In the era. Um, with respect to uh, the personal note in terms of uh, want to be a lawyer. When I was, I guess maybe seven or eight years old, um, a family member got in trouble. And I uh, grew up with limited means, uh, very limited means, as a matter of fact. And uh, the person that got in trouble, my mother uh, had to use money uh, to hire him a lawyer to try to prevent him from going to jail because he had multiple encounters uh, with, the, with the law enforcement and the legal system. And she spent every dime she had to try to keep him out of jail, but ultimately he, um, he wasn't able to keep my uh, family member from going to jail. And later on that evening, I re remember hearing my mother cry. And I only remember my mother crying about maybe, I guess throughout her life, I think I'm crying 10 times, but once when her mother died, uh, when I graduated high school, when I graduated college, when I graduated law school, she cried. And she was crying at night and mom was, my mom was tough. She was a single mom, she raised us all by herself. And so, at, you know, at that young age of seven and eight, you know, it's my mom, I just, don't worry, mom, I'll, I'll be away. And the next time this happens, you don't have to worry about spending all that money and that we don't have. And so that was like what, what, what got me at first in terms of wanting to be a lawyer because that was somebody that was supposed to protect people. And in this instance, it, it didn't happen, you know, so, but uh, upon graduating uh, uh, high school and going to college and graduating college, um, I did work the AOC um, for Joe Baracco, as a matter of fact, uh, doing research under the old criminal law prior to enactment uh, of 2C, you know, uh, after that I left there and returned home and, uh, did the casino uh, thing for a while. I held a position as guest relations manager and surveillance. Now, while I was in college, after getting older in terms of deciding whether or not I was gonna to go to law school, when I was in college, I believe it was my junior year, uh, maybe yeah, my junior year in college, I missed the lottery and I wasn't able to uh, stay on campus. Actually, it was my senior year. I missed the lottery, wasn't able to stay on campus. And so I decided to uh, as opposed to spending money for a hotel, uh, downtown Trenton, uh, they used to have these like little rooming houses there. So I figured I could, you could stay there for what you pay for one night in a hotel, you could stay there for a whole week so I could find some off campus housing. So I decided to stay down in a rooming housing and it's a, not a place of, uh, I don't call it a place of ill repute, but it wasn't exactly a, a, a fabulous area. And so Coming from class, it was late at night, parked my car down the street, downtown Trenton. It wasn't as built up as it is now when I was in college. And there was a little delicatessen that was on the store on the side of the rooming house. So I went there and got myself a nice meatball sub. But they didn't pack their subs in white paper like they do here at the White House Sub Shop. They packed them in aluminum foil. And so he put it in a paper bag, bag so I got the thing and, I'm, and I, it's in my hand. And as I'm walking up, these cops pull up and they stop me and they say, you know, where are you coming from? And I said, you just saw me. I was just, I just came out of the, 
little delicatessen here. And so then he's like, well, let me see some ID. So, you know, I was in college at the time, you know, I was a criminal justice major. So, you know, I said to him, what's your probable cause for stopping me? And what he did was he grabbed me by my neck, threw me up against the wall, said, you want to be a lawyer? Now, I wanted to be a lawyer. But at that time, I said, uh, I don't want to be a lawyer. And, and I understood at that particular time that it was nobody else there. The cop that grabbed me was white. The other cop uh, was black. He wasn't saying anything. Then he took his pencil and he stuck it inside the aluminum foil of my sub. And he did it a couple of times and he pulled out the tomato juice that was on my meatball sub. I think he thought that I was, at that point in time, I understood that he thought that I was involved in some sort of narcotics transaction. I don't know how that happens coming out of there. So then he took and wiped his pencil off and he asked me, what was I doing down there? And I told him I didn't make the lottery for college and I was staying here until I could find off-campus housing. And he got in his car and drove away. Therein, uh, that desire to be a lawyer was reignited. And so um, I still went home after that. Uh, after I graduated and I came home, like I said, did the casino thing and I went to law school. Upon coming back, uh, my first job, uh, actually my first job after college, I worked in the AOC, but then after my first job coming out, I was selected uh, as a law clerk. What a tremendous uh, honor to be a law clerk, Superior Court Judge Law Clerk. Big feather in your cap. First day there, I'm gonna make sure I'm not gonna embarrass my mom, I'm gonna be early. You know, my mom always said, if you're on time, you're late. So I get there early. And as, as I get there early, there were people walking around. It's like a glass window. You can see them walking in. But the sheriff officer tells me, you can't go up. I says, no. I says, I, I, I've been hired. I'm a law clerk. I said, I want to get up there. They told me to come a little early because the other law clerks. He says, I don't care what they told you. Stay right here. So he made me wait until 830 when all of the rest of the public was allowed. And just as a little extra pinch, he said to me, Tell the judge I said hi. Now, most people that probably would have, and I had that sort of uh, uh, spunk in me to respond backwards, but I said, no, I'm not going to do it at this time. I'm going to try to handle this in a more sophisticated manner. I'm going to not let him see that it bothered me. And I said, yes, sir. And so there, there are hundreds of other incidents, incidents uh, that you uh, experienced that uh, make you understand that uh, the color of your skin is the first thing that you may be judged by, but you cannot allow it to soil you. And that was a great experience, even at each level that I've gone, and even as a judge, I've still experienced certain things. It's funny, I listened to Judge Faulknerroy talk about his experience with a judge as uh, he worked at the prosecutor's office. I also worked at the Atlanta County Prosecutor's Office, and I remember showing up to court. I had actually gotten there about uh, 9.30. My case was at 10 o'clock. And he called uh, me up to the stand and he asked me, you know, did I know that court started at nine? I was working in the uh, special litigation section and they put all of the notices and everything in the, in the court. I said, sir, I said, you're mistaken. He was trying to embarrass me. I said, my, my case doesn't start till 10 o'clock. So he wasn't sure. So he called for recess and he went off the bench. But he must have stayed back there for about a half an hour. So then everybody started going into the back. In those days, you could go back to the chamber with the judge. He discovered that my case was at 10 o'clock and that he, his effort to embarrass me, because I had never met the judge before. He actually was in, in, went back to Cape May, the center back to Cape May. And instead of coming to me and apologizing, he just slid over to me and said, oh yeah, by the way, the case is at 10 o'clock. But I'm not gonna belabor the point. I think everybody has war stories that they're told in terms of what your hue can bring to you if it's anything other than white. Uh, but I'm not going to allow that to spoil me. My legal career has been great. Even as a law clerk, I had a great time. Uh, a lot of the judges there uh, Judge Seltzer, Judge Winkelstein, 
as uh, old school judges, uh, you may not know them. Uh, they empowered me, even my own judge did, in, in terms of helping me uh, pass the bar and the like. Uh, so I understood that being a lawyer and being black still had its challenges early on, you know? So I'm gonna pass it on, like I said, we'll come back to some of the stories, but uh, I would say that uh, later on, I, I did, after graduate, I was a law clerk, I was assistant uh, prosecutor for the city of, uh, for the county of Atlantic. I also was the chief prosecutor for the city of Atlantic City. And uh, then ultimately I was selected as Mr. Court Judge. So I guess we'll have some other stories to tell as we uh, go through the program further. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Warner. Moving to our Superior Court law clerks. Our next panelist is Lauren Booth. She is a law clerk to the Honorable Susan Fowler Maven. Lauren, please tell us about yourself and your journey to your current position as a law clerk. Well, thank you. Um, it's really an honor to be on this panel with so many great people. I'm just at the start of my legal career and I kind of hope that one day I'm, I'm, I'm up there with the stories that they have to tell. Um, so for me, I'm from Florida. I went to undergrad, not with the idea of being a lawyer in mind. I actually started off with sort of a medical path. Um, and it was later on after I had transferred schools, I was just taking classes and political science is just something that I loved in high school. And that's sort of what I ended up doing um, in college as my major. Again, I wasn't pre-law. I was like, you know, just do political science, you know, what a, what a great major to have. Um, and I ended up after that going and doing a service year with AmeriCorps. Um, so I was end up placed in Seattle, Washington. I did it, pretty much a lot of case management work with people that were experiencing homelessness, but also the idea that I worked at the organization was that there was like a whole convoluted process that I had to help people register and do assessments in order to find housing. Um, so really it was during that year that one, I decided I wanted to do public service or public interest as, it, as a career. Um, and then two, that the law and lawyers can make a really big impact in that um, field. I worked with lawyers while I was down there in Seattle. And they also encouraged me to apply and, and see what happens. Um, I did, and I was lucky enough to be accepted to Temple Law. Um, I, at Temple, I did, because I knew I was interested in public interest and public service, I did focus on joining clubs like that. So National Lawyers Guild, um, the um, Student Public Interest Network, um, just doing volunteer work, expungement clinics, et cetera. Um, I did the community lawyering clinic, things like that to get me some experience in like the public interest world. Um, and as far as to how I got to being a law clerk here, I really have to credit that to uh, my judge, uh, Judge Maven. Um, she's a Temple Law alum. And from my first year, she, come, she, she came every year and I attended every year for my first year, a talk that she gives about her story um, and her journey to being a judge. And, and really that was the first time when I saw her, I was like, oh, huh, I guess a clerkship is, is something that I, I could do. You know, like it, it wasn't this thing that other people were talking about that you kind of hear in like whispers of, because. I had no background um, as far as like having family or relatives that were in the legal field. So it was just something I heard about. So I really credit to that kind of talk my first year of kind of opening my eyes to, wow, there's judges that one, like look like me. And two, you know, a clerkship is, is something that is achievable for, for being someone like me. Um, so I really credit uh, judge me even for that. And so after doing my first year and second year, I applied um, to be Judge Maven's locker. And I was 
lucky enough that uh, she decided to take a chance on me. And so that's how I am here today. So that's pretty much it. Thank you, Lauren. Our next panelist is Zane Bird, Superior Court Law Clerk to the Honorable James McLean in our Civil Division. Zane? First and foremost, I mean, it's, it's humbling and just an incredible honor to be on this panel with so many accomplished, hardworking and intelligent professionals and just, it, it's, it's been an experience listening to what you've all had to say. Um, for me, my, what got me probably started on the path of being a lawyer, probably my biggest inspiration is my late grandmother, uh, Mrs. Weena Hill. And I guess it, it kind of started with, you know, my grandmother had a habit of just telling me, you know, you make a really good lawyer someday, which was basically translation for stop being a smart mouth kid. But, you know, one of the things that I always loved about my grandmother was always a, just had a big impact on me was my grandmother was a huge community advocate. You know, my grandmother, when she was younger, she participated in a lot of sit-ins. Uh, my grandmother lived through the Newark riots. My family hails from Newark. And, you know, up until, you know, she got ill, she participated in food pantries, you know, was big on community service and just big on giving back. And it's probably one of the smartest people I ever knew. And I think about how many opportunities were denied to her because of the area she came up in and how grateful I was because of the sacrifices she had made. You know, she was like a second mother to me. I spent most of my childhood living with her. And I was grateful for a lot of sacrifice she made to, so that I could have opportunities to do some of the things I wanted to do. Um, about when I was right before middle school, I moved into, you know, I would go back and forth on weekends to Newark, but my mother wanted me to go to a good public school in the suburbs. And when I went there, I was, first I was one of the only black kids. And then when the school merged with the south side of town, you know, there was more black folk, but the school had three levels, honors, level one, and level two. Overwhelming majority of black kids in the school were in level two. Handful of us were in level one. When I, the, I only knew one girl who was in honors at the time. So I made it my mission, okay, I'm definitely gonna get into honors. And, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do these things. And it, it was always, it's kind of lit a fire under me. So I, you know, I got into, I became very passionate about civics. Uh, I got into AP Gov and, you know, I wanted to just kind of break into those spaces. I ran for class president. I was my senior class graduating president. And that, but what I really always wanted to do was to navigate the systems that I felt were so unfair to my grandmother in her time. So when I got to college, I wanted to major in political science, sociology, or criminal justice, and or some combination thereof. And everybody told me you should probably just pick one of those. Uh, I have a I had just a penchant for being a little obstinate at times, so I decided I was going to do all three and. Couple of painstaking set of four years, and I was able to graduate my triple major. But I wanted to press on towards law school because my big thing is I always wanted to learn how to navigate those systems so that I could find ways to be an advocate for the people that I grew up around and to just address a lot of the problems that I always just felt were a little too prevalent, especially in, in communities like Newark. You know, one of the things that's really hit me a lot, especially with this panel, you know, those of you who stuck around, you've seen the PowerPoint presentation, you've heard the stories from everyone here on this panel. And it, there's a running theme is just hearing how many of them had to be the first black, et cetera, and just how much trailblazing had to go on for things to just, for that baton to be a little more in reach for the, for the next person. And for that, I'm very grateful to all the practitioners who have spoken on this panel. And I guess a major goal of mine has always been to, I want to be able to better navigate the legal field 
and to be able to be part of just making things a little easier for that next generation, to put things a little more in reach, you know. It's been noted that, you know, just most black people, unfortunately, they, we all have our set of war stories, you know. I, I think on times, how many times where if I was with my white friends walking around, I was fine, but let me be back in New York walking by myself or anything like that, let my backpack be a little too big, let my, you know, attire, I guess, look a little less like I do what I do. And how many times I've had to explain where I'm headed or where I was coming from and stuff like that, that keeps me going. And I find it so important to, you know, make use of the opportunity I have. And that's why I'm grateful to be clerking. I'm grateful for the opportunities I've had and to work where I have. I got to work with the Rutgers International Human Rights Clinic, working on human rights cases. I got to volunteer for Essex and Newark Legal Services, helping advocate for the housing rights in the courts for the most disadvantaged people in Essex. And, you know, I, it's, I just, my, my major hope is, and what's kept me going on the journey is to be able to give back and to just pay things forward. And it's very evident to me that everybody on this panel has done their part in paying it forward. And I definitely just hope to one day be a part of that. Thank you very much, Zane. We'll wrap up our first question uh, with our court managers, beginning with Charnette Clark. Charnette is our Visnage Chief Probation Officer in Atlantic and Cape May counties. Charnette. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, uh, Sandy, for having me on this extinguished panel. I'm really honored. Uh, I was a little hesitant, you know, believe it or not, everybody's like, what, Charnette, I'm nervous. <laughs> but um, my career path definitely was not to work in the judicial system. I um, was a kid growing up in Newark, inner city, public housing, single mom. And I wanted to be Diana Ross. I wanted to be an entertainer. I wanted to be famous. Um, I did school plays. I played the clarinet, you know, I sang. Um, I went to high school, school of performing arts. And um, I just knew that that was the path that I was going to take. And then when I got accepted to Drew University, I became the entertainment there. So every Friday I was seeing at the pub called The Other End. And uh, my freshman year of college, I was in the student cafeteria and a peer uh, said that they didn't want to stand in line with me. And I guess growing up in Newark, a uh, predominantly black community, I didn't really experience that until I got to college. So I was taken aback and um, I definitely did not take the high road. And uh, the young lady and I had to end up meeting with the dean. And so I did explain to them that I was upset because I didn't understand the fact that someone didn't want to stand in a, a lunch line with me. And that um, they felt confident enough to say that in my face. And then I was to, supposed to politely walk away or I guess uh, move in the back of the line like she told me to, and I did not. And from that day, it made me more involved in a lot of the activities that was going about at Drew University. So um, I participated in our student union and we fought against auctions. So how a lot of com uh, communities or committees at the university made money, they would do auctions where they would have people stand in an auction and um, you would pay for that particular person. And um, we marched and politicized and did a lot of things and we were able to end that my freshman year in the late uh, 80s at Drew University. And I'm very proud to be a part of that. I'm also the first uh, resident assistant for our African-American um, studies house called uh, Ujama at the time, because uh, we wanted to make sure that we did some cooperative economics and make some money. And so um, what led me to be more in the field of law was when I did my internship at Morris County Pretrial Services, well, Pretrial Intervention, PTI, and we had to interview some kids from the, that decided they wanted to run away from home and follow the Grateful Dead. And um, 
in that meeting with them, I realized that the role that I had taken on at Drew University was what I can now bring back to Newark and help my family, help my community, and to be better. Um, I started volunteering. Um, I started participating in Habitats for Families. Um, I started um, doing community events where I would sing for free, um, doing the national anthems and things like that at different sporting events. And that way, I was able to just make myself known in the community. Everybody knew who I was. So when they had a, a job fair in Essex County, 1990 uh, to be exact, the first and last, I think, job fair that they had. And that was how I got my first job with the courts as a program coordinator. So this is the only job that I've ever had, everyone. Um, and come April 22nd, it'll be 30 years on the job. And um, we had a job fair and I wanted to be a probation officer, but I didn't get to be a probation officer because at the time there was a hiring freeze. So they hired me as a program coordinator and then called me back and told me <laughs> that I didn't have the job because they lost the grant for the program. <laughs> So I'm like, wow, they hired me and then fired me all like in the same week. <laughs> and I get a call back that there was some funding and that um, I can start uh, a couple of weeks as a program coordinator. And I think the great thing about being in the community that you work at, you're able to help everyone. And that's what I was excited about. Um, people knocking on my door, asking questions, uh, legal questions, even questions that I knew nothing about. Uh, I worked in the family division for 25 years, but it gave me an opportunity to ask people, uh, meet other judges in Essex County because I had questions about a neighbor or a family member. And that educated me more in wanting to do more in the court system. And I think that's what led me to where I'm at now as the chief probation officer. But I think my energy, my outspokenness, my tenacity is what helped me overcome some of the adversity. And I was able to deal with it a little differently than probably some of my, my peers in Newark. And so instead of retaliating more in a negative way, I felt that if I showed them my success and showed them how I can be better than what I was told that I was gonna be, that that was how I was gonna prove that I, I was going to make an example and make a statement for people that look like me. You know, so I, don't, I wanna hold everybody up, but um, I do appreciate once again for being a part of this uh, group. Thank you. Thank you, Charnette. Our final panelist is Brian Jetter, Municipal Division Manager in Atlantic and Cape May counties. Brian. Hi, thank you, Sandy and Ellen. It's been an honor to be a part of this panel and this discussion. Um, my path to becoming a manager is, was pretty unlikely and definitely unplanned. Um, my experience growing up led me to some very uh, destructive behavior um, and being part of the judiciary system was one of the least things that I thought would be part of my life and my career, my career goals. Um, Growing up, I, I had the unfortunate uh, pleasure of losing both of my parents at a very young age, which for me uh, triggered some, some very strong and emotional feelings that was difficult for me to reconcile uh, as a youth. And in that, I acted out in some very, very bad behaviors. But with that said, um, eventually, uh, probably was about 23 when I started having this conversation and it changed my life about how my feelings and emotions was triggering actions that in the long run was hurting me. So I figured that out and I went to college. Um, I, I went to school for computer information systems and I planned on becoming a computer programmer. Um, of course, in this area, those jobs were very, very minimal. Like you, it was very hard to get a job as a programmer in South Jersey. 
and I wound up taking a job in the casino industry in the IT department. Um, I also, at the time, took a part-time job with the city of Atlantic City. Um, in that job with the city of Atlantic City, it afforded me an opportunity to apply for an administrative analyst job. And um, I got that job, and I began working in the Health and Human Services Department as an analyst. Uh, in 2001, I transferred to the Atlantic City Municipal Court as an analyst. And that was my introduction to the judiciary uh, system and career. I um, decided to take principles of municipal court administration classes and learn more about the judiciary system and how it works. From there, I guess in 2008, I became the chief court administrator for the city of Atlantic City Municipal Court. And in 2013, I became the municipal court director, which led me to this job in 2017 as the manager for Vicinage One in Superior Court. Thank you, Brian, uh, and the rest of the panel for, for sharing your journeys with us. Moving to the second question, but uh, uh, we are going to um, talk about this. Please tell us about your experience as an African-American justice professional. Now, because of um, our time constraints, um, because it's nearing four o'clock, if you would each just take uh, three minutes uh, and tell us the biggest challenge or the biggest the biggest challenge or the biggest opportunity um, that you've been presented with, Brian. Uh, as an African American um, professional, and just as an African American in America, um, of course, I realize that uh, racism and discrimination exists. Um, however, in my position now, of course, I'm, I may not have experienced that. But in the past, of course, in society, we all have our encounters with racism or discrimination. Um, I remember as a young man uh, being detained by the uh, police. and. They drive me down, and I was a youth growing up in Atlantic City. They drive down the boardwalk with me in the back car. And I was just coming out of a friend's house. But they said I matched the description of someone who may have committed a robbery. So as they drive me down the boardwalk in Atlantic City, approximately three miles from where they picked me up, they call these two uh, elderly women to the police car and they say, is that him? As they're looking at me and I have no idea what's gonna happen next, they say no. And as you can imagine, I'm thinking in my head like, this could be bad. <laughs> but when they said no, the officers got out of the car, they let me out and they said, get out. And the thing that sticks in my mind is not the fact that they could have made a mistake and misidentified me. It's the way they treated me after they realized they made the mistake. They actually laughed as I asked them, well, uh, can you take me back to where you picked me up, where my vehicle was? And that, to me, is the crux. We all make mistakes is how you deal with those mistakes afterwards. So the judiciary, for me, the challenge is also an opportunity. It's to build that trust in our communities, to bring that back and so that we can treat everybody fairly and understand that we may make a mistake, but how we treat you after that is what's important. That's what builds goodwill. That would bring, that's what brings trust back to our communities and to the people. Um, we do outreach programs and events, and even these virtual events such as this uh, enlightens the public, brings about education, and I think that's the key 
to uh, having a successful uh, judiciary system is is engaging in the community, allowing them the opportunity to have access, to treat them fairly. And um, those are the benefits and the opportunities that I really appreciate by being in my position, to be a part of that, to be a part of the new legislation that goes out, that, that levels the playing field for everyone, and that everyone involved. Uh, I believe that that is what makes this judiciary great. I'm proud to be a part of it, and I'm proud to be a part of this panel with so many other people that have paved the way so that I can be able to sit in this seat. And I hope that everyone appreciates the depth of, of knowledge and insight that was provided by our distinguished members on the panel. And thank you. Charnette? For me, um, like I said before, my personality, I think, is what um, helped me um, in my field in the judiciary. Um, I was very eager to learn from a lot of my peers, from judges. I had no problem sitting in a courtroom or walking over to ask someone for some help or ask a question. And I think that um, built my self-confidence. But by also building that self-confidence, I learned that when I was able to sit at the table, that there were times that um, what I had to say may not have been of importance or that I may have been overlooked or that I may work a little harder on a particular project or event, but was not given the recognition that my counterparts may have been given. And or um, when I did decide that I wanted to speak up or felt that I needed to have a say, I was looked upon as maybe being abrasive, aggressive, or angry when all it was was that I just wanted to have that opportunity to have a say. And I thought that I was being ignored or that I thought that I was treated as if I was not smart enough or confident enough to express myself or get the job done as my white male or female counterparts were. But um, I do have to say that in my 30 year experience in the judiciary in Texas, as well as in Atlantic, I have been given that opportunity to have a say. And I am very appreciative of that. And I think having an opportunity like this also gives an opportunity to share with other peers in the judiciary that it's okay to be yourself. And when I was promoted to chief, the first thing that my assignment judge said to me was Charnette, be yourself. And that really made me proud and made me happy that I didn't have to mask who I was in order to do a great job for the judiciary. Thank you. Thank you, Charnette. Zane, would you like to answer the question uh, th in three oh, minutes? Oh, sure. I can. I, I'll. I'll try to keep it to a minute and a half. Okay. Um, no, for me, what, probably one of the you know obstacles has kind of been when you're in certain spaces, especially ones that are predominantly white, just kind of overcoming that feeling of just being up under the spotlight and feeling like you have to be exemplary because in those spaces you feel a representative of your people. You know, I think back to, I worked three consecutive uh, internships in the district court. And for all but two of those years, I was the only black intern for any of the district court judges. And that was only because one year there was one other one, you know. Um, and then even in, in law school, I went to law school in Rutgers, Newark. Uh, you know, this is a Northeastern law school in, in North Jersey, uh, in the heart of Newark. And I was one of four black men in my graduating class. And we all kind of used to, you know, kind of share our burden, but we had this feeling that we have to rise to the occasion. We have to be exemplary. And on the one hand, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Because on the one hand, it's definitely a motivator and it's definitely driven me to go out there and achieve, and achieve more. But at the a lot of times there's, there is a significant feeling of pressure. So I think a lot of that is kind of doing your own, 
you know, I guess internal navigation, internal maintenance, and just kind of dealing with the, that feeling of rising to occasions as you come to them, you know, crossing bridges as you come to them. Thank you, Zane. Lauren, your next same question. Thank you. Um, I would say for challenges or that I faced that, well, I guess I'd answer it. Let me say this. So unfortunately, there is still challenges that the judges were talking about in the past that are still today. Um, you know, yes, things have gotten better, but some things still need a lot of improvement. Um, you know, I remember my first year, I they were doing like alumni interviews and it was this, you know, this big lawyer, she worked for Skadden um, down in Delaware. And um, they said, okay, you know, you need to just drive down, do this mock interview with her. It'll be great. So I go and like, I'm in my suit, <laughs> you know, have my little leather binder thing with temple on it. And I go up to the front desk and I was like, uh, I'm here to see so-and-so. And they go, okay, you're here for the, um, who was it? You're here for that secretary position, right? And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm actually here for, because I said I'm here for an interview. And they go, oh, for the secretary position. I'm like, no, no, just, I'm just for here for an interview. You know, and so it's just like, even nowadays, it's not, it's like who, I still show up and it's like, who, what are you here for? It can't possibly be an interview for a job at the law firm. You know, that can't, that can't possibly be it, you know? Um, so there is still, there are microaggressions and all those other things that are still existing. But I would say the flip side to that, that I want to say is that some things have definitely gotten better. I mean, I can be in a space and not be the only, you know, Black law clerk or at Temple, they have, you know, a really good Black law student association, a good group of students there, um, not an insignificant amount of people. Again, this is maybe a low barrier, um, but I still see that as definitely major improvements. And then also just even me being in this position and having Judge Maven as my judge, like that to me, that's even just like such a great sign of progress and that I'm able to clerk for her and, you know, that she was able to hold that door open for me. And, you know, hopefully as I go further in my career, I can do the same for somebody else. Um, so yes, there's still a lot of challenges left, but I, I've, you know, there's progress. And I, I think definitely for me and Zane, we're a little bit of the proof of that progress that that's coming. Um, so that's my answer. Thank you, Lauren. Judge Warner, uh, would you like to answer the same question? Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, give uh, Judge Fauntleroy enough time because I'm really interested in what he has to say. I, I just take a philosophical approach from it. And I understand that uh, with every challenge, if you view it as an opportunity to make things the way that you think they should be, that's the approach. And every time you're given an opportunity, you have to understand that being black, there are gonna be challenges. Just like the story I told you about when I was a law clerk, when I was assistant prosecutor, there are gonna be challenges. And you just have to adopt a philosophy where you can do it, where you can resolve it, where everyone is happy at the end of the day. And, and I think if you adopt that sort of uh, philosophical approach, it certainly makes life a lot easier. And also it leaves both opponents at least looking at each other where you're not really scarred up as opposed to just having an aggressive response to um, the issues with respect to, to race. Um, I'm not going to take much time. I know you're short on time, so I'm going to dedicate my time to uh, Judge Fauntleroy and Judge Cunningham. Thank you, Judge Warner. Judge Fauntleroy, it's your turn. Would you please answer the question, the same question? Yes, I think, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Judge Warner, for putting me on the spot there. Uh, Oh, it's just on my screen. It's just unmute myself. Uh, in any event, um, yeah, I, I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, Judge Warner and I uh, often discuss uh, uh, our positions as judges and um, and being lawyers and the things we went through to get where we are today. 
But I, I do want to share a couple of things, one of which is, uh, uh, and Judge Warner and I have talked about this a number of times, about being on the bench and being able for people of color to see us on the bench and to show and give to them the same dignity that we would do anybody else. Uh, I was telling uh, Judge Warner uh, before I went on the bench, I did a lot of municipal uh, court practice and there were a number of judges in Atlanta County and Camden County that uh, whenever you were in the courtroom and you would hear, hear the judge's voice raised and it was being uh, um, aggressive and you look up and it was usually a person of color before them. And I remember one incident, I was in Williamstown Municipal Court and, uh, and my client was white. Uh, I was with the law firm then and uh, this judge was just going off, off and off on uh, black people. So I told my client, I says, look, you stay here, but I have to go up and sit in the front and let this guy see I'm in here. You know, and I, and I did that and I just basically sat there and stared at this guy for most of the court session until my matter was heard. He had taken a recess and I went in and he says, well, what are you here for? Did you work it out with the prosecutor? I said, yes. He says, okay, well, we're going to be going back out shortly. I didn't say anything to him at that point. And I went back out and I sat down and he was, you know, still on that same thing. So when he called my case, I think he went, you know, I started to, you know, put what the, the deal was. He says, uh, uh, you want to help your client? You want to just talk all night? And I already know what the deal is, and let's go. And I knew he just wanted to get me out of the courtroom, so I put it through. I told my client goodbye. I went back in. It was a night court, and I sat there for another two hours staring at this guy because I just wanted him to see me and wanted him to know, know that I knew what he was doing and I didn't appreciate it. Um, then there was the. Uh, uh, I did a lot of federal court practice and I was doing a civil rights case, uh, a police uh, unlawful uh, force case. Uh, and, uh, and the magistrate had sent our case to uh, mediation. So I get there, there's the white lawyer who represents the two troopers. I'm sitting there and he comes out, the mediator, and he says, well, um, okay, he looks at everybody and says, Okay, when the other lawyer gets here, we'll have a conference in the back room. And uh, <laughs> my counterpart, I could see he was red as a beat, but I just waved my hand. That. But then when I went in there, because there are times when you have to say something. And I remember going in there and the guy was like shocked. And I, and I told him, I said, this is the 1980s. There are black people who practice, uh, there are black lawyers who practice in the federal court system and you should understand that. And he was like, but I, I just felt I had to say something. And the same thing with being a municipal judge. Those judges, uh, especially the one in Atlanta County who I knew, and I would often tell him that I think, you know, and he would just slough it off and everything. But when I went on the bench, the one thing I always said to myself, no matter what I'm going to do, I'm going to be fair, but I'm going to show everybody dignity because to me, that's the equalizer. You show people dignity, they will listen to you. Um, they may not like what you do in the end, but I want them to go away feeling that I was fair and I showed them the same dignity that I would expect from anybody else. And uh, and that's, that's something as a black judge, I think you're more akin to realizing that because we've seen how it has affected our people. You see it all the time in every walk of life. And, and you just know that people are just downtrodden. And if you can give them some dignity in their life, then you've done a great deal for them. And that's what I've always, uh, uh, always tried to do. Thank you, Judge Fauntleroy. Before we continue, we, we have two additional, two speakers yet, uh, Judge Maven and Judge Cunningham. Um, I just want all of you to know uh, it's nearing 415. We're certainly going to continue um, with this very engaging webinar. But for those of you that cannot stay past 430, 
I want to share with you the CLE uh, code word. The code word is James Coleman. Again, the code word is James Coleman. Um, the code word will also be posted in the Q&A area. If you missed uh, the, the um, pre-show slides, James Coleman was the first Black New Jersey Supreme Court Justice. All right. Uh, Judge Maven, I apologize for the interruption, but would you like to answer the same question? Yes, thank you. Um, this, this is a very, and I, forgive me, my dog has just started barking. I, I apologize. Um, this, this is a very important uh, issue for me because it, it resonates with me every day, particularly now that I'm in my 19th year and thinking about you know, where I wanna go from here. It, it strikes me that in 2001, when I had the opportunity to be a judge and even years before that, I am the first African-American female judge on this bench and have been the only female black judge for all these years and um, and it strikes me that it's, I have an awesome obligation, not obligation, but opportunity to use my presence on so many ways um, that's been evident if you were to read my resume, uh, read my bio, uh, which, which was presented. Now the bio I presented is very short uh, compared to what my full bio would be. But if I had the time, I would tell you that being in this position has given me an opportunity um, to share my experience um, to young lawyers back at Temple. I go back to Temple every year. I've gone back to Temple every year to do a lunch and learn. You heard Lauren speak on it. And through that process, I have uh, had the opportunity to hire law clerks from Temple and from other students, from other schools as well. But to develop this young talent, to let these young people know that there is an opportunity uh, to work in the court system. As Lauren said, she, she had been exposed to the clerkship because I went there and she showed up for the program. I like to think she didn't just show up for the free pizza, but I'm glad that she walked away with more knowledge and that was the opportunity to come work with me. And I'm, I'm so proud and so pleased to have her, but she's not the only one. I've hired other young people from Temple by doing that same thing and other law schools as well. Uh, in addition, I've had the opportunity to use this, uh, this platform to be very involved in committees on the state level um, and various uh, positions with the judiciary and in the community. In the community work, being in his role as a lawyer, as a judge, and prior to that being a lawyer, um, being involved in the community is so very important. Um, although lawyers are, judges are constrained in some ways, uh, certainly being involved in the community is not one of those constraints. And so I've been very open and very involved in the community, putting myself out there uh, to be involved. And people are surprised. Oh, you're a judge? You're a judge? But you're so, you're so normal. I'm like, you know, like judges, they have an impression that judges are standoffish, that they are somewhere like the wizard behind the screen. Um, but it's important for people to know that I'm a judge. I shop at ShopRite. I'm in the community. And, you know, if you see me, you can speak to me in certain ways. Um, as far as my current role as a juvenile court judge, when I had the opportunity, obviously I was in family, for those who know, for many, many years, for most of my career, did a few years in criminal, had the opportunity to go to the appellate bench. When I went to the appellate bench, as long as the judiciary has been here, I was the second black female on the appellate bench. I had the opportunity to work with Judge um, Paulette Sapp Peterson, who was I had the privilege of being in her a panel. So she was able to, to share her experience and help mentor me along. Uh, but she was only, she was the first African-American appellate judge. I was the second. Um, and so for those four years and that experience, you know, I learned a lot, but then I decided I wanted to come back to the trial bench and, and continue some work um, pretty much where Judge Jackson had laid the foundation for all those years in the juvenile court. And this has been the most impactful way I've contributed uh, since January, 2016. For those families to come in with kids who have uh, come into some challenges, 
uh, to see that there's a judge here, not that they get their way with me, believe me, that's not the issue, but to understand that as challenging as it can be for those families and for the young people, that, uh, that they can be heard and that I'm sincere in providing as many of the services that we have in the community that we can. So it's important in this role to do all I can for the community and let them know that there is equity um, with respect trying to nurture from where I am using the strength of my, my position to help these families along. And, and that's where we stand at this time. Um, I, in my role as a judge, I consider my law clerks as part of my extended family. I've stayed in contact with all of my law clerks from the beginning of time. Uh, we have continuing conversations. I've been to weddings, I've been, baby showers. I, you know, we stay in touch and I'm not unique with that. A lot of judges do do that. Um, but I love the role that I play and I find it as a unique and uh, important experience to create that network amongst my law clerks so I can join them together. They reach out to each other if they need to. Um, I continue to foster that relationship because it's important. And that's something that I value and I will always value. Thank you, Judge Maven. Judge Cunningham. Thank you so much. Um, when it comes to opportunities, that I see as a result of my experience and my journey to becoming an African-American justice professional, a judge, uh, prior to that, an attorney. Um, the greatest opportunity is to really make a difference, to be an impact which each, with each individual that you come in contact with. Um, and I've always taken steps to make it really my job in interacting with people. Um, in a way that I treat them with respect, with dignity and fairness, so as to inspire them to understand that there are people out there that are willing to listen, that there are people out there that are not looking down upon uh, people based upon their color or based upon their, their social background, that what they say matters. And that's something that I carry every day um, in my role as a judge right now is really giving, trying to give people an opportunity to understand that I'm, I'm, I'm willing to listen. The system is willing to listen. This is a judge who is really working, trying to assure that things are fair, that you have your say, that you have your day in court, because that's important. That's something that's been missing. Um, and in the minds and the, the perception of a lot of people in the, in the African-American community. So I see every day as an opportunity to, to make a difference, to try to reach someone uh, by showing respect, by showing the ability to, to listen, um, showing that I'm willing to really be fair in everything that I do, so as to add legitimacy to what we're doing uh, before the court. That it's not really something that you perceive from watching TV that's inherently unfair, but something that we all can work together to shape into something that's admirable and something that should be um, respected based upon what we bring to the table. So I, I found that the greatest opportunity is really just interacting with people every day um, so as to inspire them. Um, to act differently, to carry themselves differently, to be patient, to show respect to one another, um, not by speaking loudly or having a lot of things to say, but the, the more subtle things of calling someone by their name, uh, looking at them in the eye, um, giving them an opportunity to be heard, explaining to them how uh, certain processes are going to move forward so they can gain further confidence that yes, the system works for them. Uh, this is an individual who, who cares, and that's important to me. Um, an additional opportunity is really just to really work in a profession where I can be inspired by the stories that we're hearing today from other uh, justice professionals, other judges, um, and to have an opportunity to work in a profession um, that can make a difference in a way that we have seen through the stories today that we saw in the PowerPoint program as far as the efforts and the hard work that people of color um, brought to the table to reach certain stations of life. 
So the opportunity to be part of that history, uh, part of that profession is very important to me. Um, but it leads to the biggest challenge that I'm saying that we still have conversations about why is there not uh, more people of color in, uh, in judicial positions? Why are there not more people of color in positions uh, of power when it comes to the judicial system or as justice professionals? And that's a challenge that we have to continue to work toward. Um, and it's unfortunate that we're at that point, but um, we're gonna to continue to make stride, continue to have programs like this to do the things that we need to do. Um, again, to put ourselves in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Cunningham. And to all of our panelists for your openness and the challenges you have faced and your courage in seeing the opportunities in those challenges. Um, now it's time to move on to our Q&A segment. Uh, this first question is posed to the judges. So any of you that would like to respond, certainly feel free. Have you followed careers of African-Americans clerking for you and others? Uh, have you been given equal opportunities or are they by analogy byproducts of the NFL Rooney rule? Uh, have hired associates in firm been, firms been able to move up fairly? I guess it's a three, three part question. I'd like to answer. Um, yes, I have followed the careers of my uh, most many or most of my former law clerks. I'm proud to say that many of them are doing well and are uh, moving up or moving in good directions. I'm very pleased to say that some of my clerks have uh, trailblazed, uh, or they've actually somewhat followed in footsteps that I've been in. So I've been able to continue to help them. In the beginning of my career, um, my focus was land use planning and development. So I represented you know, builders and developers, planning boards, zoning boards and the like. And I'm pleased that uh, one or two of my clerks have moved in that direction. I then had a job at the Transportation Authority uh, for a year and a, one of my more recent clerks is now working in transportation. So I'm able to continue to share and, and help her along the way with some thoughts and ideas I might have. And I'm pleased to say that one of my law clerks uh, works for a, a large law firm, works at Cooper Levinson, and she's recently been made a partner at Cooper Levinson. So she's trailblazing uh, in that regard. And I'm very proud of her and all that she's done in this community and what she will continue to do uh, in the community for the law firm and for the legal community. So um, it's important, as I said, to, to continue to be a mentor because there are steps and bumps along the way in all professions. And so I am here to help uh, my law clerks and any of the law clerks or any young lawyer um, who wishes advice. They don't have to be, you know, African-American, you don't have to be a brown skin. Um, I'm open uh, to discuss and help anyone along the way. If my skills and, and experience can help, I'm here for them. So uh, yes, to answer the question, I have followed and some of them are doing well and moving up in their firms. Thank you, Judge. Would anybody else like to respond? Okay, uh, I'll move on. Uh, the next uh, two things are simply statements made. Um, one individual wrote, thank you to Judge Maven and Judge Fauntleroy for paving the way for me and so many others. By the sound of the law, the law clerks, we are fortunate that there are those that will continue the legacy established. And another individual wrote, I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you all for sharing. Um, oh, some more coming in, bear with me, please. Uh, another comment, some assistant prosecutor positions may open up soon in Cape May County. So I, I pass that on and encourage you to follow the path of Judge Warner when he was a prosecutor, okay? Um, two of your colleagues, judges wrote, thank you, great presentation. Another wrote, thank you so much to all of the presenters, an excellent panel and presentation. Well, I'd like to thank all of you 
for taking your time and participating as panel members. And I hope that our audience um, enjoyed this engaging conversation as much as I did. Um, this was a very special Black History Month celeb celebration uh, for Visnich One. Thank you and have a great evening, everybody. <laughs>